Good morning. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, I'm Dr. Simon Durrant and I'm director of the Lincoln Sleep Research Center. And today I'm going to talk to you about the sleeping mind. What happens in your mind while you're asleep? So just to give you a little roadmap of where we're going to be. Uh, First of all, I will just introduce you to the different types of sleep. Sleep is not just one thing, but we have different types. So I'll show you a little bit about that, particularly in terms of brain activity that actually occurs during sleep. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about sleep and how much sleep we get, how much sleep we need. And then what happens if we don't get enough sleep? What happens if we're sleep deprived in terms of our ability to, to think, our cognition? Uh, and looking then at people who are suffering from long-term loss of sleep, particularly insomnia, the difficulty of actually getting to sleep or staying asleep. And then if we have time at the end, just a little insight into some of the functions of sleep in the context of mental health. And in particular, I'll look at one type of sleep called REM sleep and depression and how this might be related actually to emotional memory and how emotional memory is processed during sleep. So that gives you a little overview of where we will be going. So just to start with an introduction to sleep, we all experience sleep, we all know what sleep is. Uh, defining it is a little harder than you might imagine. Obviously it's easy, relatively easy to see if a human being is asleep, uh, but if I gave you something like a fruit fly, would you be able to tell if a fruit fly is asleep? Not necessarily easily. Um, the definition of sleep typically involves things like the loss of consciousness, that it occurs on a regular cycle, typically a 24 hour cycle, uh, that it's a natural state, it doesn't require any special trigger, you just opt to try to go to sleep. Uh, there is reduced nervous system activity uh, during sleep, but that's uh, something we will come back to because it's not absolutely true or not as true as it was once thought to be. Um, and that it is involved in rest and recuperation, which is true, but again, we will come back to that too. So why do we need sleep? So we spend a huge amount of our time actually asleep. What's the benefit of it? Could we dispense with it? So there are a number of different possible functions of sleep. Um, Alan Rechaffen was one of the early sleep researchers. Uh, he developed a system of what's called sleep scoring, which is to look at the looking way, looking at the structure of sleep. Uh, and commented, if sleep doesn't serve some vital function, it is the biggest mistake evolution ever made. And I'll come back to evolution and sleep in a moment. So possible functions are things like resting tired limbs, energy conservation, lack of movement during dangerous nocturnal hours, um, benefits to the immune system, and possibly also benefits to neural activation and to cognition, to thinking, to problem solving. There are problems with many of these, however. Um, the first three, so resting your tired limbs or conserving energy, etc., can all be achieved through quiet wakefulness. If you're sitting in front of the TV, quietly just watching, you're not really using much energy, you're not using your limbs. Uh, so a lot of these can be achieved through quiet wakefulness, and it's considerably less dangerous from an evolutionary perspective than actually losing consciousness. So sleep from an evolutionary perspective is a dangerous thing to do. Uh, if you lose consciousness, you are wide open to predators. So there must be a pretty compelling reason for it. Immune system performance, yes, there is good evidence that the immune system does benefit from sleep. Um, so if you're uh, unfortunate enough to contract COVID-19 at any point, one of the best things you can do is get a lot of sleep. Uh, Neural and cognitive benefits, yes, definitely. Now, obviously, the, the number one characteristic of sleep is the loss of consciousness, or at least an altered consciousness in the case of dreaming, but a loss of consciousness for a lot of the time. Um, and a loss of consciousness, meaning switching off your conscious ability to think, etc., strongly points towards cognition. It, it interferes with cognition, and it, there must be a reason that we need to turn off our cognitive uh, faculties for a while. So, um, but we still don't definitively know. Uh, William Dement comments, as far as I know, the only reason we need to sleep that is really, really solid is because we get sleepy. 
So I'm hoping that we can do a little better uh, today and point to some of the other reasons. So sleep is divided into what we call sleep stages. So it's not just one thing. Um, and more broadly, we're going to call these arousal stages or arousal states because we're going to include wake as well. And they're defined by the electrical activity in your brain. So you may or may not know that your brain obviously contains many neurons and neurons communicate primarily through electrical means or electrochemical means. Uh, they use chemis little chemical molecules to cross little gaps between neurons, but the neurons themselves operate in terms of voltages uh, and uh, currents. So, one of the techniques to looking at brain activity is to put electrodes on people. Literally, you attach electrodes to people's scalp. And they can, these electrodes will pick up electrical activity that is due uh, to brain activation, to neural activation. Uh, this varies substantially during sleep and wake. So the pattern over time of the electrical activity varies substantially. Um, as a result of that, we can divide sleep and wake up into different stages and we can know which stage we're in based on that activation. Uh, and the activation has a number of characteristic things. One of the things while you're awake is this thing called alpha rhythm. It's kind of hard to see on the screen, but you can sort of make it out in this top channel. So this is an electrode sitting in the center of the head. Um, and this little alpha pattern is an indicative of somebody who's got their eyes closed, is relaxed, but is still awake. Um, and you get relatively high muscle tone. So the bottom two lines here are measuring muscle tone, which we also do. Um, the next two lines up, these two lines are measuring um, uh, eye movements. And then the top line is measuring brain activation. So there are small eye movements still, uh, even while your eyes are closed, you will still actually be making small eye movements and then you get high muscle tone. So that's during wake. The transition into sleep, which starts with what we call stage one non-REM sleep or NREM sleep, uh, as juxtaposed against REM sleep, which I'll show you in a moment, is characterized by the loss of alpha rhythm. So alpha rhythm disappears and actually you get rolling eye movements. So if you ever see somebody fall asleep, you'll see their eyes begin to actually roll around. There are also these little things that we call vertex sharp waves. So you get little short bursts uh, of electrical activity, um, relatively low in amplitude. So not that many neurons taking part in them. Um, and they're quite rapid and they're characteristic of stage one sleep. Stage one sleep only is about 5% or so of the night. So it's relatively unimportant. It's just ten, tends to be dismissed as a transition stage. Stage two sleep, by contrast, makes up about 40 to 45% of the night. So this is what you get most of uh, in out of any sleep stage during the night. It's similar to the original stage one, um, but it's characterized by two additional things. One is called sleep spindles. Uh, and you can see there, just highlighted in the green arrow, uh, sorry, the green circle, um, is a sleep spindle. There are a couple earlier in that trace as well. So sleep spindles represent firing of several hundred thousand neurons at least at once uh, at a higher frequency than they were firing at for a short period. It's generally between half a second and two seconds. And then they just go back to doing what they were doing. Spindles are associated with what we call neuroplasticity. So learning changes in the brain as a result of learning. The other characteristic in stage two sleep are K complexes, uh, which you can see at the end. So this is a very large synchronized activity by a lot of neurons, potentially millions uh, of neurons engaged in this. Um, these are believed to be 
what are called slow waves, and I'll come to slow waves next. Um, and this is an isolated example of a slow wave, um, but we, it occurs during stage two sleep, we call it a K-complex. Um, K-complexes in isolation have no known function, so this is one area uh, of active research still, so it's something we actually don't know what they do, but it is suspected that they are just slow waves, uh, but just an isolated slow wave on its own. Which brings us to stage three non-REM sleep, which is slow wave sleep. So this is deep sleep. If you've ever seen somebody really deeply asleep, they're hard to wake up. Um, they are probably going to be in this deep sleep, which we call slow wave sleep. And it's characterized by these high amplitude slow waves. So they're like K complexes, but there's a whole series of them in succession. Slow wave sleep, deep sleep, is essential for memory. Uh, it is essential for restoring your sense of wakefulness. So when you uh, get more tired as the day goes on, or when you get more tired as the time since your last period of sleep occurred, it's slow wave sleep that you need. And if you get enough slow wave sleep, it will remove that sense of tiredness. And you will get lots of slow wave sleep. Uh, it will take priority over other types of sleep when you need it. You get most of your slow wave sleep in the first half of the night, not all, but most. Um, and it is involved definitely, we know, in memory consolidation and also in what's called synaptic downscaling. So synapses are the connections between neurons. And when you learn things, your brain modifies the strengths of the connections between the neurons. Uh, and typically, synapses are strengthened as a result of learning. But clearly, if you just strengthened all synapses, uh, then eventually everything will be connected to everything else and you would go crazy. So you need some way to actually reduce the strength of synapses as well. And that is believed to occur during slow wave sleep. And then finally, last sleep stage is stage REM sleep. And this is one of the, uh, the most interesting. So REM and slow wave sleep are, are the, probably the two most interesting sleep stages. REM sleep you get mostly in the latter half of the night. This is when most of your vivid dreaming occurs. So if you tend, if you wake up sort of 4 a.m., 5 a.m., you will often remember a dream that you were just having. You do dream during other stages, but they're not as memorable and you're less likely to wake from the other stages. And REM sleep, so REM stands for rapid eye movement. Uh, this is sometimes called paradoxical sleep historically because uh, it looks a bit like wake. Um, but it's characterized, as the name would suggest, by eye movements. So the second and third lines down are channels that are measuring, these are sort of electrodes that are measuring eye movements. And you can see from about the halfway point, suddenly you get lots of eye movements occurring. And if you've ever watched somebody sleep, particularly in the latter half of the night, you will see their eyes moving. Um, uh, if you have pets, pet, cats, dogs, etc., you can see this in them too. They also have REM sleep. Uh, all birds and all mammals have REM sleep. All reptiles and all insects do not have REM sleep, which is strong evidence that this is an evolutionary adaptation, a quite an, a fairly old evolutionary adaptation. Um, what is REM sleep for? Well, apart from obviously the vivid dreaming that we know, it's believed to be involved in some form of what we call procedural memory. That's to say motor learning. So if you learn to ride a bike is the classic example. Uh, that's what we call procedural memory. It's a procedure. It's a technique, a motor learning uh, exercise. Um, it is also, and we will come to this again at the end, involved in emotional memory consolidation. So you might have already observed in your own life that if something happens uh, that is a strongly emotional experience for you, you tend to remember it much more than things that are less dull, uh, sorry, that are more dull, uh, things that are less interesting. Um, and the reason, one of the reasons for that is uh, that these memories are strengthened and reprocessed during sleep and REM sleep uh, is believed to be the stage 
that is involved in this. Though exactly how it happens uh, remains open to research. We actually don't know exactly how that happens. Uh, neutral memories, by contrast, uh, seem to consolidate much more during deep sleep, slow wave sleep. Okay. So they are the different types of sleep. So we get the three different stages of non-REM sleep and REM sleep. And of course, people can be awake. So next question is, how much sleep do we actually get? And this varies as a function of age. So it changes across the lifetime. Uh, young adults, he says, uh, you guys, um, tend to get uh, around seven and a half eight, even nine hours, uh, depending on their age. So you can see on the y-axis there that zero to 600 is in minutes. So 600 minutes would be 10 hours. Um, just under 500 would be eight hours. Uh, so you can see uh, earlier on, five to 10 year olds are getting much more. So they're getting sort of nine and a half hours. And then it drops somewhat uh, up to about the age of 35 where it stabilizes for a while. Uh, and then it begins to drop again when you get quite uh, uh, much later in life. So sort of around 75, 80, it, it drops off a little bit more. Within the overall amount of sleep, however, uh, the structure of sleep varies um, somewhat as a function of age as well. The one thing that is relatively stable is REM sleep. So the amount of REM sleep uh, tends to to remain relatively static across the lifestyle, lifespan. Um, you don't lose that much even when you're uh, into well into your 80s or even 90s, you're still getting a reasonable amount of REM sleep. What does drop off substantially from an early age is deep sleep, is slow wave sleep. So older adults tend to get much less deep sleep. Some estimates would suggest up to a third of older adults get almost no deep sleep. Um, and certainly it drops off um, substantially, it begins to drop off uh, around, well, I mean, it begins to drop off right at the beginning, it stabilizes around the age of 25, and then it begins to drop off again, uh, more substantially around the age of, sort of 60, 65. Uh, stage two sleep uh, shrinks a little bit, but generally that's uh, relatively static. Uh, stage one increases as you get older. So this is a very light transitional a sleep stage, and that's reflecting the fact that the amount of time you spend awake after you first went to sleep, so the number of times you woke up and the amount of time it took you to get back to sleep, which we call wake after sleep onset, or WASO, which you can see up there, uh, that increases um, substantially as you get older. So um, you will wake up more uh, later in life compared to earlier. So hopefully you guys um, sleep reasonably well. So young adults will typically obtain around seven to seven and a half, near a seven uh, hours sleep on most nights. So that's how much sleep do we get? How much sleep do we need? And this is one of the uh, most prevalent urban myths in society is that you need to get eight hours sleep a night. Um, it varies by age, but in fact, uh, the average sleep duration that people are obtaining is seven hours. So the graph on the left, the, the blue bars there, uh, are showing the average amount of uh, sleep that people obtain. So this was um, obtained from a survey of about 11,000 people in the UK. Um, Average was around seven hours. Quite a lot of people were getting six hours. Quite a lot of people were getting eight hours. 50% of people said that they felt they had too little sleep. Um, but only 20% of people actually reported that they were sleepy during the daytime. So many of the people who said they did not get enough sleep were actually fine during the daytime, even though they thought they hadn't got enough sleep. Um, and most of the people who were sleepy during the daytime were actually not amongst those who said that they didn't get enough sleep. So there is a, a degree of, um, I don't know a better term, neuroticism in, in the population as a whole uh, about getting enough sleep. Um, and many people feel they don't get enough sleep when actually they do. 
Um, how much sleep do we actually need? And one of the strongest results in all of sleep research, but in some ways one of the more surprising uh, results, at least if you're buying into the, the eight hours a night um, belief, is that mortality, so this is your likelihood of dying, or you can translate loosely into the average lifespan, uh, peaks, um, well, sorry, the average lifespan peaks, so mortality itself is at its lowest on average for people who obtain seven hours sleep a night and not eight. And mortality at eight hours a night is actually approximately equivalent to people who are obtaining four or five hours a night. Uh, and as you get more sleep above eight hours, it gets worse. As you get less sleep below seven hours, it gets worse. Now, this should not be, and I always have to give a note of caution here, it should not be translated to an individual circumstance. Individuals vary widely. If you feel you need nine hours sleep a night, get nine hours sleep a night, that's fine. Um, it is just at a population level, the fact that as a population we get seven hours sleep a night is fine from a mortality perspective, that is actually optimal. So that is uh, ideal for um, living a, a long and hopefully happy uh, life. It's also worth looking, there is a slight difference between uh, men and women. Women, interestingly, their mortality is less susceptible to uh, losing sleep, so to lower sleep durations on average, um, the effect of mortality is, is, is not as bad, it's worse in men, um, but getting more sleep uh, tends to actually impact women, um, less, uh, in, impact them more. Um, figures vary uh, in terms of the overall duration, relative durations of men and women, um, but in general, men get slightly more sleep actually the women so again this fits the pattern so as a as a whole as a population uh, we are actually remarkably good at getting the amount of sleep we need in order to live as long as we can um, without even necessarily knowing how much sleep we should be getting we, we're getting it anyway uh, but this is not always true and obviously there are many people who are sleep deprived it is uh, a popular story in particularly you'll see in the media that we are all very sleep deprived in modern society. Is this true? Well, one interesting source of data uh, was a survey in the US that looked was carried out in 1985 and again in 2004 and said how much sleep do we get and what proportion in particular of people are getting no more than six hours a night, which is clearly less than they should be getting. And you can see for both men and women, and it varies a little bit, but it's true across all age groups, uh, the number of people, the proportion of people getting less than or equal to six hours a night increased quite substantially between 1985 and 2004. So we are becoming... Uh, more sleep deprived as population. However, um, we are still uh, getting on average around seven hours a night. So it's not too bad. Uh, the amount of sleep varies um, overall. Uh, it varies across country and it varies by uh, survey. So Finland, people tend to get a fair amount of sleep, up to sort of seven, seven and a half hours. Uh, Finland, as you may or may not know, has excellent educational outcomes. So that in itself is a little bit of evidence that sleep might actually be good for achievement and cognition. And we'll come on to that in a moment. Um, UK, we were a bit further down at around six and a half to seven hours in that survey. Another survey put us down at nearer sort of 6.3. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed view. We probably are getting less sleep than we used to get um, but we're still getting more or less enough sleep so we're not as badly sleep deprived as we tend to think we are what happens if you are sleep deprived so the record what's the longest sleep deprivation anybody's got well the, the record for what uh, uh, for a scientifically monitored period without sleep so this was uh, some 
guy back in the 1960s uh, called Randy Gardner, who uh, set the record of 11 days and 24 minutes, which is huge. It is absolutely, it's quite remarkable that he could go that long uh, without sleep. Um, he was in a pretty bad way at the end of it and was very happy to get some sleep, um, but he did quite well. There have been attempts, uh, undocumented attempts to break the record since, some suggestion that some uh, American woman in a rocking chair managed sort of close to 19 days, but it wasn't really verified, so it's hard to know. Um, the effects. So I've just put a couple of pictures there. These are, there are YouTube videos produced by the guy in, this picture, in, the, in the picture. Uh, which are worth looking at if you're interested in the effects of sleep deprivation. Uh, he actually um, documents what happens in uh, in his uh, as as he's losing sleep, um, starting off when he's relatively okay, uh, and he comments later on that he's beginning to experience hallucinations. He's beginning to feel paranoia. He's seeing physiological effects on his skin. Uh, he's much slower in his speech. He feels somewhat disoriented. So a whole range of negative symptoms um, occur. And that was after about 72 hours. So he was sort of on day three of sleep deprivation. Um, I wouldn't recommend trying sleep deprivation experiments yourself unless you uh, are really that inclined. It's generally not, not good for you, as you'll see there. But if you do, those are the things that you can expect to experience. Now, there are obviously potentially very serious consequences to sleep deprivation um, sometimes. Um, some of you, uh, depends how old you are, might remember the Selby rail crash or not. This was uh, a fatal rail crash, unfortunately, caused by a train hitting a car on a level crossing. Uh, the car was on the level crossing because the driver fell asleep at the wheel and the car went off another road down an embankment and onto the railway track. Um, and was hit by the train. Sorry, I'm not sure it was a level crossing, actually. It was, it was on the railway track um, and uh, derailed the train, caused some fatalities. Uh, so it can be extremely serious. Um, there are, in, in the US, it's estimated that perhaps 100,000 road traffic accidents each year are caused by sleep deprivation. So it is, remains a major cause of accidents uh, in the UK as well. Um, so sleep deprivation it can have very serious consequences. So what happens to cognitive performance after sleep deprivation? Is there a deficit? Well, short version is yes, um, and in a whole variety of ways. So cognitive performance really just refers to our ability to think, uh, our ability to solve problems, to remember things, but also includes things like our attitude to risk, our moral judgments, etc. Decision making. So, one area um, that is particularly affected by sleep is the attitude uh, to risk. And you can measure this using something called the Iowa gambling task, which sounds like fun. That is quite fun as psychology experiments go. Uh, so, essentially, people are given um, a bunch of decks and they can choose cards from the decks. And uh, the decks have different probabilities of good outcomes or bad outcomes. So, good outcomes, you gain some money bad outcomes that you lose some money. And the idea is that people will eventually learn which decks are worth taking uh, the cards from. But the attitude to risk comes in because some decks give higher payouts and higher losses than other decks. Overall, they are not good decks to use because you will lose more money. But if you get lucky, you will on average, uh, so you will occasionally, um, you will on average, you will lose money, but occasionally you will get a really nice, good outcome. Uh, it's a bit like buying a lottery ticket. So on average, people who buy lottery tickets lose money uh, because the cost of the lottery tickets is not covered by their winnings. But obviously there are occasionally exceptions, some spectacular exceptions and people will win millions of pounds. Um, so this is rather like this and it's at it. So it's measuring attitude to risk. So what happens after sleep deprivation versus normal sleep? Um, and if you look at, so we've got three graphs here. If you look at the one on its own on the left in the first place, uh, the open circles, the white circles, are uh, the baseline. So these are people who are not sleep deprived at all. And over a period of time, so blocks of cards really just represents time. Over time, they learn 
um, how things work and they tend to get better. Um, and they are tend by choosing the lower risk decks, they're getting better. By contrast, people who are sleep deprived, so they are the square, uh, the black squares, they get better for a while, but then they start to take risks to increase their income. And so they actually get worse again, a little bit worse. And that pattern actually follows people who have brain lesions, parts of damage in their prefrontal part of the brain, which controls decision making and risk. So you, what you see in people who are sleep deprived is essentially it's almost like a temporary brain damage. So their ability to make decisions is as impaired or follows the same pattern of impairment as people who have actually sustained brain injuries for, uh, in some way. This characteristic also gets worse uh, with age. So the older you get, the more susceptible you are to the negative effects of sleep deprivation. So most of you are relatively immune to really bad decision-making consequences of uh, sleep deprivation at the moment, although it varies hugely by individual, as we will see. Um, but as you get older, uh, it gets worse and worse. Now, risk taking is in itself a form of impulsive behavior. And impulsivity more broadly uh, actually gets uh, worse. So something I won't go into the details of it now, but it's called the emotional go, no go task. So this is measuring your ability to inhibit your response to something you shouldn't be responding to fundamentally. Um, uh, but this in, in this case, using emotional uh, stimuli. So it's engaging an emotional system. Um, so it's measuring, it's some sort of measure of impulsivity. And what you see for people who are sleep deprived um, is that they are much more likely to uh, respond quickly to negative things than they are to positive things. So they actually get slower for positive words, but they get faster for negative words. And they get faster, uh, they get slower overall because you do get slower to, in your response after um, sleep deprivation. You get slower in almost all of your actions after sleep deprivation. Um, but they are quicker actually to negative things. And overall, they are much more likely to inappropriately respond to negative things. So there is evidence that there is this increase in impulsive risk-taking behavior after sleep deprivation. But as I say, this varies a lot across individuals. Uh, and one, it sounds simple, a very simple task, but uh, something that nobody really thought about doing until this uh, point, and it was really very cleverly done. Um, a simple thing that was done was three measures of um, sleepiness or alertness uh, in some sense, uh, was were used and the results as you can see in the three graphs are plotted by individual so their performance on each of these things was plotted and it was plotted after seven days of sleep deprivation um, partial sleep restriction so down to six hours a night or extension or normal sleep the pattern of results in itself doesn't matter what matters what you can see there is that the variability across different people is much greater than the variability within people. In other words, the effect of being of having 10 hours a night versus six hours a night versus a normal seven hours a night is much less within one person than the difference overall between one person and another person. So you may be much, much more susceptible to even small change to sleep deprivation than your friends or your parents or your siblings or whoever, for no particularly good reason. Um, it's just a characteristic. So this is what we call a trait-like characteristic. So although clearly there is uh, some susceptibility to sleep deprivation, the effect happens 
uh, much strong, more strongly in some people than in other people. Now, sleep deprivation, when experimentally or induced or socially induced or temporary, is one thing. But there is a section of the population who suffer from sleep deprivation in an involuntary manner and very often on an ongoing basis. And they are people who suffer from insomnia. Insomnia, as the name would suggest, is the inability either to get to sleep or to stay asleep or to get back to sleep after you've woken up. But primarily the inability to get to sleep in the first place uh, is what we're talking about with insomnia. So this is widely prevalent. Um, so one in three adults in the UK suffer from insomnia when it's defined as insufficient sleep. Uh, one in 10 suffer from daytime impairment uh, as a result of this. The estimated cost in the US to uh, the economy is something like $31 billion. This was a few years ago, but probably higher uh, now. So chronic primary insomnia. So this is where insomnia is the main complaint as opposed to a byproduct of something else like chronic pain um, is affecting about 6% of adults at any one time. So that's still quite a substantial number of people, something like one in 16, 17 people at any one time is suffering from chronic primary insomnia, which means they're going to lie in bed for sometimes literally hours, but very often at least half an hour or more, unable to get to sleep, however tired they feel. So there are many different definitions. Um, generally speaking, uh, for a clinical definition, you're going to need to suffer from a difficulty of getting to sleep for at least three nights a week over a period of about three months. That's the definition that the NHS will use. Now, insomnia is actually not the only type of sleep disorder. There are many, many other types of sleep disorder. Um, things like movement disorders, so-called restless leg syndrome, where you have the urge to move your legs when you're in bed. And this is, um, it sounds crazy, but it's actually very distressing for people who experience it. Uh, and obviously keeps them awake so it has sort of what we call comorbid insomnia um, comorbid just meaning another condition that occurs alongside it narcolepsy you may have seen occasionally videos or stories about people with narcolepsy uh, who just suddenly without warning fall asleep um, this is due to uh, a, a neurological deficit in uh, from the most uh, in most cases of uh, narcolepsy a very specific and reasonably well understood uh, neurological condition. There's obviously insomnia disorder. One of the most common that you will see, see and hear more of in society as time goes on is what's called obstructive sleep apnea. If you've ever seen this, um, you might have seen somebody sleeping and uh, they stop breathing for a period of time, maybe up to 30 seconds, sometimes a minute um, or more. And then they will typically wake or partially wake, sort of gasping for breath. Then they will go back to sleep. Then it will happen again. This is called sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea. It's because the airway actually closes uh, during sleep uh, as a result of weak muscle tone or excessive sometimes excess fat during uh, around the neck. It is associated, strongly correlated uh, with obesity, though you do also get it in individuals who are not obese. Uh, so it's not 100%, not but there is obviously a strong correlation uh, there. Um, and it can be quite a serious disorder. Uh, in extreme cases, it can actually even lead to brain damage because of the loss of oxygen. It leads to quite substantial reductions in blood oxygen levels. Um, so uh, it, it is something that requires treatment. Now, thinking about insomnia, there are a number of factors that affect our ability to go to sleep. These can be physiological factors. So uh, the temperature is uh, not right. Um, you might be feeling too physiologically aroused. Uh, you might be in pain, all sorts of things. There, there are behavioral factors. Uh, you've been using your mobile phone late at night. Um, I suspect many of you do. Please don't. It's bad for you. Um, or if you if you really do insist upon doing it, try to put it into a low blue light mode. Uh, blue light will keep you awake. It inhibits melatonin production. Melatonin is a hormone and neurotransmitter that is uh, essential for uh, getting to sleep. 
There are also environmental factors. So uh, it might be too bright, uh, it might be too noisy, it might be too hot. Um, your mattress might not be comfortable. And then there are psychological factors. And since we're talking about the sleeping mind, I will look at the psychological factors. So most, not all, but most sleep disorders have a psychological component. It is the most, in, in some sense, the most important and one of the harder ones to address. Not, not always the hardest, um, uh, but certainly one of the harder ones to address. But it's a very important component um, in insomnia is a psychological one. And the classic uh, scenario is somebody who is lying in bed worrying about something. Uh, they might be worrying about work, family, health, relationships. Very often they're worried about their inability to get to sleep and when are they going to get to sleep and are they going to get enough sleep before they have to get up for work or school the following morning. There are various solutions um, to insomnia. One of the solutions, obviously, that is widely used are sleeping pills. Sleeping pills are problematic for a number of reasons, not least of which is that for the majority of people, they don't work. Um, and for almost all people, they have negative side effects. So they will leave people feeling very drowsy the following morning. They will impair their ability to think, to make decisions. They cause an increase in accidents on the way to work or to going to school. Uh, they will cause people to over uh, oversleep in the morning, etc. Impossibility of getting up, etc. So there are a number of problems. Plus, of course, um, older sleeping pills are still widely used called benzodiazepines. So, if you've ever heard of Valium, um, very popular in the 1960s, uh, still prescribed uh, occasionally today, uh, that's a benzodiazepine. Um, those types of medications also cause memory loss, uh, quite substantial memory loss, and they are also addictive. So, there are good reasons to prefer not to take sleeping medication if you can avoid it. So one of the alternatives is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy uh, or CBT and cognitive behavioral therapy programs, which are about essentially retraining the way that you think in order to change the way that you feel. Uh, one of those types of programs is designed specifically for insomnia. So we call it CBTI or cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. Um, so this is a professional psychological treatment uh, that is growing in popularity and prevalence. It's very, uh, you might say, very fashionable at the moment, um, but also very effective, as we'll see. There are also alternatives, easier alternatives. So meditation on mindfulness are also growing in popularity. You can get mobile phone apps often for free for those, uh, some of them with specific sleep programs, and they tend to work quite well. So, CBTI, how does it work? Well, the thought, the idea is that you have a vicious cycle, generally, particularly uh, that affects insomnia, uh, though obviously this, this applies actually more widely as well, which is negative thoughts leads to negative emotions, which lead to negative behavior, which leads to negative thoughts, which leads to negative emotions. So you end up in this vicious cycle. What you really want are positive thoughts leading to positive feelings and positive uh, behavior and cognitive behavioral therapy is designed to enable you to do this. Uh, it combines a whole variety of, of different things, different ways of thinking about sleep. Uh, different. It does also include environmental things, things about the, uh, the the bedroom environment and what you can do to make it more conducive to sleep. Behavioral changes as well, uh, but very much focused on ways of thinking. Um, about sleep. It is distinct from what's called sleep hygiene. So you will see uh, some talk uh, about sleep hygiene in medical settings. So your GP surgery, for example, will probably have a leaflet about sleep hygiene. Uh, and that's fine. The sleep hygiene is a good thing to do. It's not quite the same as CBTI because cognitive behavioral therapy is customized to the individual. So it's very much focused on what are your negative thoughts and how can we replace those with something more constructive, something more useful to you. Uh, sleep hygiene tends to be much more standardized, uh, much more um, static. So sleep hygiene is actually often a part of CBTI programs, but it is only uh, one part. 
So it's, it's a bit different. And sleep hygiene is just a one-off. Here, go do these things without any follow-up or assessment, whereas CBTI is much more interactive and occurs over a period of weeks, normally with a specific therapist. So final part, sleeping mind. What happens if you can sleep, but you are suffering from another disorder, which is depression? Is this related to sleep? Is it related to emotional memory and emotional experiences? Because obviously depression is an emotional condition. So depression is uh, unfortunately uh, also like insomnia, growing in prevalence in population. In, uh, um, and it does particularly affect young people. I mean, it affects all age groups, but young people are disproportionately uh, affected by depression. Um, it is uh, one of the unfortunately causes of death in terms of suicide. Uh, and it is a devastating condition for those who experience it. Um, so anything we can do to help people who are suffering from depression um, obviously is a, uh, a positive thing. Now there is a relationship between depression and sleep and in particular REM sleep. So you remember REM sleep where you get these rapid eye movements, your vivid dreaming uh, occurs mostly in the second half of the night. So up to 70% of, oh, really at least 70% of patients with depression uh, show quite substantial changes to their sleep patterns and in particular you get REM sleep occurring earlier in the night if you have depression and uh, you get more REM sleep if you have depression. Those things also actually occur, tend to occur before the onset of the main symptoms of depression. So actually these changes in sleep are a good predictor that you are going to experience um, depression. And if you can catch those symptoms early on and address them, that might help. Now, it's perhaps no coincidence that most antidepressants, so medication designed to help alleviate uh, depression, uh, reduce the amount of REM sleep that people get. That's, that was not an intended effect of the antidepressants when they were developed. Um, and it doesn't occur in all, but it does occur in the vast majority of them. Um, and this has raised, obviously, some attention and uh, thought, well, perhaps given that depression results in an increase in REM sleep normally and that the antidepressants are reducing REM sleep, maybe this is part of their mechanism. Maybe this is one way in which they work, because nobody fundamentally really knows in any definitive way how the antidepressants work. We know, obviously, that they're designed to increase the availability of a neurotransmitter uh, called serotonin. Uh, some antidepressants also increase others, um, like dopamine um, or uh, noradrenaline, but um, serotonin is, is really the key one. So you get these antidepressants called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which basically mean once the serotonin is out there in the brain and in, it's been um, exported, if you like, by a neuron uh, to use for communication between neurons, um, after a while, the serotonin is reabsorbed by the neurons, but the the reuptake inhibitors simply uh, reduce the amount of reabsorption or the speed of the reabsorption. So they increase the availability of serotonin to continue to be used. Uh, that's the way they, they are believed to work. Um, but there are a lot of things that are still not understood, not least the long period of time, four to six weeks before most antidepressants start to work. Uh, so uh, one mechanism of action could be that uh, this lengthening of REM sleep is reduced. So thinking about that, what happens during REM sleep and uh, particularly in terms of emotion and emotional memory? Well, one thing we know is that an area of the brain called the amygdala, which is entirely uh, associated with emotional arousal, especially to negative things, though you do see some arousal to positive things as well, but more, it's, it's more strongly active towards negative things. 
Uh, this area called the amygdala is particularly active in people with depression. So they will respond more strongly. They will see you will see a stronger activation in the amygdala to something negative. So a negative image or a, you know a scene of something sad happening in a film or something like that. Um, you will get a stronger amygdala response to this negative emotional thing in people uh, with depression uh, compared to those who don't. It is also the case that individuals with depression are more sensitive to, in the sense that they are more likely to notice negative things in their environment. So there is this negative, what we call a negative perception uh, bias. So you're more like, if you're depressed, you're more likely to notice negative things, bad things, things that are potentially upsetting, and you will see a stronger brain activation in an area associated with arousal, uh, negative emotional arousal. Um, now, if you put those two things uh, together and add one more thing, what you will see is a potential continuation or maintenance of negative emotional memories. So if somebody is perceiving negative things more readily and getting a strong activation to them, that is one thing. But if that were a transient thing, if it if it only occurred temporarily and then stopped, perhaps it would be able, we would be able to cope with it. But during REM sleep, we consolidate, i.e. we strengthen the memory of emotional events on emotion things that we have perceived or experienced as emotional and if you have more REM sleep you will spend more time strengthening these negative things and you'll strengthen them even more so if you have a bias towards negative rather than positive things and you are strengthening emotional things more generally and you put those two together that means you will be strengthening more negative things and this leads to what we do see in people with depression, which is a negative emotional memory bias. They are more likely, if you are depressed, you are more likely to remember negative things and less likely to remember positive things compared to somebody who is not depressed. Um, and this combination of increased REM sleep and a negative biased amygdala is likely to be responsible for this, or at least could be. So we've created this model called the attack model, which, which shows this. Now, if that's the case, one solution to that might be to eliminate or to reduce REM sleep, the amount of REM sleep. Because if you reduce the amount of REM sleep, you prevent this strengthening of these negative emotional memories, or you reduce the amount that they are strengthened. Um, and thereby you break this negative cycle, because obviously if you're remembering mostly negative things, that makes you more depressed, and then you remember even more negative things. So it's a downward spiral. And what we want to do is to break that by preventing people from remembering the negative things. Uh, so we did an experiment um, whereby we're presenting people with negative or neutral images. And this is what's using what's called a split night design. So comparing people who slept only in the first half of the night in which they don't get much REM sleep with people who slept in the second half of the night where they get a lot more REM sleep. Um, so both groups are sleeping for the same amount of time. They're not totally sleep deprived, but they're partly sleep deprived. Um, but one group is getting much more REM sleep than the other. And we were looking at people who are depressed versus people who are not depressed. And what do we see? Sure enough, people who were, uh, so we see depressed participants showed much greater of consolidation of neutral memories during the early sleep, the, the stuff that's rich in deep sleep and not much REM sleep. And we know that deep sleep is associated with neutral memory strengthening, so that's fine. Um, but they had greater consolidation of negative memories, negative emotional memories in the late sleep group, the REM rich sleep. So this confirms the uh, both the fact that more REM sleep seems to lead to stronger negative emotional memory, but also that if you remove that REM sleep from somebody, 
uh, they, they will not strengthen that emotional memory to the same extent, which is what we were hoping for. And you can do this also um, with, sorry, with total sleep deprivation. Um, so again, we did this. So BDI2 is uh, it's a questionnaire that's designed to evaluate depressive symptoms in individuals. So we're comparing people who have uh, high depressive symptoms, the higher BDI2 school group, with people who have less. So this is relatively mild to depression, but these are still depressed versus uh, not depressed. And again, what we see um, is that uh, there is greater consolidation of negative items in people who slept normally for the whole night versus people who did not sleep. So we gave them a whole night of sleep deprivation. And the result of that was that their remembering of negative events was much lower the following day. Uh, they were also, of course, sleep deprived the following day. So then you have to give them rested sleep. So we did give them rested sleep. And then we tested their memory again a couple of days later. And still their memory for the negative events was lower. So this suggests that sleep deprivation uh, can be used as a therapy. And in fact, sleep deprivation is used as a therapy for depression. This is actually one way in which people can alleviate depressive symptoms. Um, however, uh, it doesn't work for everybody. We're currently looking at the genetic basis. We've done some work on this already, and without going into the details, there are some people who, for genetic reasons, are more susceptible to the REM sleep memory consolidation connection and for whom sleep deprivation will work much better uh, than other people as a therapy. It's also just worth noting as a final point uh, that this applies not just to depression, but to related conditions um, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, where again, um, increased uh, um, REM sleep, the uh, increase actually even in, literally in the number of rapid eye movements that you get during REM sleep is associated uh, with uh, maintaining uh, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. And so depriving people of REM sleep, either through sleep deprivation or through medication which addresses REM sleep, might be one way in which to do it. So this just gives you some idea of the things that are happening in the mind during sleep. So we are strengthening memories, emotional memories uh, during REM sleep, neutral memories during deep sleep. Uh, you get obviously these different types um, of sleep. Most of us are getting enough sleep, but perhaps not everybody and perhaps not as much as we used to. So we know there are different types of sleep. We're generally getting sufficient sleep, but it might be getting worse. Um, if you don't get enough sleep, it's going to impact your decision making and make you more prone to taking risks. Uh, and But if you are getting too much sleep or if you're getting too much REM sleep, it might be giving you too much emotional memory and if these are negative emotional memories because you're depressed this might be leading to the maintenance of depression so maybe reducing REM sleep might help with that uh, thank you very much um, I'm afraid I think we're out of time I have time for literally one one more perhaps two questions but um, thank you very much for uh, listening and watching and um, do get in touch if you are interested in anything more. If you're um, looking for a university, do come and uh, work with us in Lincoln uh, because we have uh, a sleep centre and a sleep laboratory here and we very much welcome people's involvement. So thank you very much.